quite a tall order to uh, give a talk after that wonderful talk. So uh, please allow me to go into the charts and figures because it's going to be somewhat technical. I wish I could just tell you the story without those, but unfortunately I can't. Now the question that I'm trying to uh, not answer, but uh, give you clues at least, uh, what I think about that is can we reverse the climate change? Many of you may be aware of the obvious answer, but we're going to look at it. If the climate change is a, a phenomenon of its own, is, is it something that we don't know or something that we know we can grasp, we can fix it with our technology, or it's something related to other stuff that we have to figure out how to find a sustainable solution. So, So is it real first? Because there are some people uh, skeptic about the climate change. They are saying that, well, it's, it could be a fluke. First of all, the, uh, perhaps the biggest evidence, we know that the February was the hottest month ever, hottest February ever recorded in the history. There, the temperature anomaly reached all, more than 11 degrees in the North Pole. There were very warm weathers in, around the North Pole area. And we were affected by it. Uh, we had unusually warm weathers as well in here. And if you look at the, the history, starting with the Industrial Revolution, the temperatures are rising uh, pretty much sustainably. It started rising uh, around the uh, mid 90s, the uh, 1900s, and then it keeps rising then. Now, as scientists, uh, when they look at the reasons, there are several. Uh, there could be several reasons, but one of the culprits is the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. As the carbon dioxide increases, it captures some of the heat on Earth. It has this blanketing effect. It wraps around the Earth nicely, and it just insulates the Earth a little bit. It keeps one or two watts per meter square which is very low compared to the total amount of heat that we are getting the sun, but that is enough to increase that temperature. And the, most of the scientists were trying to keep it, uh, sorry, around the 350 level, but the current level this year in March is 404. We already passed the 400 level, which was one of those dangerous uh, levels Many of the climate models uh, uh, were thinking that we should keep this below 400. Now the next level is 450, and we are not sure we're going to be able to keep it or not. The main reason that we have the carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere is, of course, the use of fossil fuels for transportation, for other energy uses. This is really sticky, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so what would be the consequences of this? I mean, is it, is it, some people may think that, well, it's okay. The, climb, uh, the temperatures will rise, we'll get warmer anyway. We like the uh, winter time, we don't have to get cold. But issue is related to everything else. One of the dangerous ones is the extreme heat waves and drought in our part of the world. And rising sea levels and floods, this is one of those sci-fi movies. And loss of biodiversity. This is a critical issue but because it related, it's related to other stuff as well. What it means is that the, a lot of the species, plants, animals, uh, algae, big animals, small animals, are getting more and more extinct, including the fish in the oceans. And more and stronger hurricanes. This plot shows that the percentage of uh, the rising, the strength of the hurricanes is increasing after the year 2000. So, this will have a detrimental effect in civilizations, throughout the civilizations everywhere in the globe. Not only in the US, nor in China, in Middle East, in Turkey, Mediterranean, Australia, wherever you go, it will have huge effects. Especially, regular people will get hurt even more because of these natural disasters coming one after another. It's going to affect their lives more than uh, the counterparts people. 
Now, if you look at the carbon dioxide emissions and the energy consumption, you see that the developed world is just pumping, uh, dumping carbon dioxide, I should say, to the atmosphere. And the developing world, especially heavily populated ones like China, they have huge carbon dioxide emissions because of their energy signature. If you look at this plot, the energy and growth relationship, which could be one of those underlying things that we should pay attention to. This is the power consumption per person, and this is the GDP per capita. There is almost a linear relationship. All these developed nations, they have about $50,000 per capita uh, income, and they are uh, using more than 100 kilowatt hour per day per person. They have affluent lifestyles. Developing world, heavily populated, not only there is a population increase, but there is also growth, what we call the economic growth, which is the current model in the world is laid out by Milton Friedman. He says that improving the ordinary lives, uh, lives of ordinary people, we need the free market economy. There is no other way. The governments should not interfere anyhow. Anybody should not interfere anyhow. We should leave the money in the capitalist's hands and they should take care of the problem, the free market economy. And that is a working model, in fact. The world, there is a tremendous growth in the world since 1980s, but this growth is associated with heavy use of energy and the carbon dioxide release as well. Most of the energy use, if you look at it in buildings, the domestic housing is mostly heating, and transportation takes one third of our energy use, going everywhere by car, plane travels, and other uh, uses. And industry, which works for us, of course. If there isn't an industrial use of energy, we wouldn't be employed, and everybody will be jobless. So we need that as well. But the question is, how much do we need that? Is there any other way? Before getting into uh, those questions, let's look at the, uh, the, if we can fix this immediate problem, the rise of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If you can go to the next slide. Yes, I get that too much. So, is there any hope of controlling it? If you look at it, the carbon dioxide released in some units, gigatons, this huge amount of carbon dioxide dumped into the atmosphere every year. Whenever there is a sort of a hiccup in the uh, economic growth in the world, that carbon dioxide release stops for a while, and then along with the economic growth, we see that the more and more carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. But in 2014, something interesting happened. We grew 3% in the world, but the carbon dioxide emissions decreased a little. Something's happening. The, all that talk about the renewables and everything else could be working. Can we reverse this trend? Or how can we reverse this trend? So there are several scenarios. People in the uh, world energy uh, uh, organization and everywhere are working on different models, the climate models. What it looks like, so there are several scenar scenarios. If we don't do anything, this is going to be terrible. So we got to do something. And what we do something is, Either independent nations take actions, most of them are developed countries, and China, luckily, is one of them. And we may push the technology towards uh, the renewable energy and carbon capture. It'll help more. This is called the bridge scenario. And there is one more scenario, keeping it below 450. Aggressive actions taken by governments, which may reduce the carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. And we also see that, actually, the, the picture is interesting. Developing, developed world already saturated with their energy profile. So their carbon dioxide emissions already in decline. The problem is, it, is with the developing world, actually. They are potentially, as they uh, grow more and more, they're going to be dumping more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we have to find ways to handle that. I want to visit this uh, uh, assumption about the relationship between the growth and the energy uh, consumption. The economists 
Some economists say that, well, there, isn't, there shouldn't be any relationship. Some economists say that there should be. And there are some famous paradoxes also. One is a very old one from 1800, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jabez. He says that the efficiency gains increase the fuel use. Bas his basic argument is that if you find an efficient engine, people will travel more. They will go further, so overall uh, fuel usage will be increasing. Now, the modern version of that paradox is uh, Kazun Brooks postulate, and they are saying that if we increase the energy efficiency, we would be increasing the consumption of the energy. So not necessarily taking efficiency measures would work in favor of consumption. So that's part of the big picture, actually. In the developed world, there's no problem. They already grow and they have uh, plenty of energy for anything. They have affluent lifestyles. And now they are trying to modify their lifestyles to reduce emissions. They are trying to be environmental cautious. But the developing world, with the energy efficiency measures, they're going to be using more and more carbon dioxide energy and release more carbon dioxide. So, <laughs> technological solutions. In transportation, we have electric cars already sold. This is like a $35,000 model. Fuel cell cars are already being sold. These technologies, everybody's hoping that they're going to be widespread pretty soon. Fuel cell probably is, has a longer way to go, but the electric cars is right there. They're coming. And for longer distance transportation, the Hyperloop, they're being tested. And even a transatlantic tube replacing the airplanes, because airplanes also releasing a lot of carbon dioxide. So technologically, we have the technology. We have to find a way to implement that. Other way, also redesigning the whole uh, power technology, the smart grid, because a lot of the renewable technologies are not ready for the uh, classical grids that we have in Turkey, we have in China, the uh, rest of the world. The, what's the, what we mean by the smart grid is that all that renewable sources, such as photovoltaic modules, they produce energy during daytime, in the middle of the day. You may not need that energy, so you have to find a way to store this energy or use it smartly with some very effective pricing and stabilized grid control schemes. So, once we have the smart grid, then we can develop carbon capture technologies for the existing thermal plants, which we practically, this is a very interesting design, that you can do the coal gasification combined with the fuel cell technology to capture all the carbon dioxide. It's a coal plant slash a fuel cell, and all the carbon dioxide is captured. And other measures for the existing uh, thermal plants. So we can capture the carbon dioxide released by those power systems, then we will be able to control it. And there are benevolent capitalists such as Mr. Bill Gates, who is working on modular uh, nuclear reactor technology, cheap, cost-effective, safe, without any proliferation threat, can be used safely. That technology, if it comes out successful, it can be deployed. And of course, the fusion technology is waiting in the line. But we are not sure if it's going to be able to catch up with this development or not. So we have a lot of solutions on the technology side that can be used to uh, reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. Now there is other side of the coin. We have the, this free market model. These countries must grow or increase their energy usage to grow, to live comfortably, to go out of poverty. But not just the socialists. Everybody is saying that there is something wrong with this model, including Pope. Everybody knows that Pope is not a Marxist or is not a, he's not a communist. Some capitalists, investors, even a very strong candidate for the US pres presidency, when he's accused of being a socialist, he says, yes, I'm a socialist, so what? And very influential people writing bestseller textbooks so that everybody can read and find the, uh, there is something wrong with this model. And of course, not just the climate, there are other stuff too. This is the, uh, the number of species wherever <coughs> the humans go since the beginning, it's just a large number of humans, uh, other humans, 
fish, large animals, plant life, everything go extinct. We have too much inter intervention with <coughs> nature. We think that the nature is our enemy from the beginning. We are fighting against the nature, the taming the beast, war against the natural disasters, but we are ruining it. And we are getting a very this is an animal, and one of many animals, which is a seven foot tall bird, which was extinct a long time ago when humans first stepped in Australia. <coughs> there are 10 other species like that. This is a modern the story of uh, cod, which is a very common fish, the standard fish in fish and chips in Britain. Since 1992, <coughs> it's gone, extinct. So, and there are other threats as well, such as the uh, um, Climate change, loss of biodiversity, geochemical threats, ocean acidification, land use, fresh water. There is a nice study uh, talking about the planetary boundaries and the resilience of ecosystems. And they are working on which thresholds are already passed, which thresholds are not passed yet, so we have to do something about that. For example, the, in terms of biodiversity, we. Many animals and the plants uh, which are extinct now, we cannot find a solution. They're gone. They're, they're gone from the gene pool. Climate change is already getting the yellow level. The uh, atmospheric nitrogen and phosphorus levels, which are the cause of many other extinction problems, they're already uh, past those boundaries. So we have to think about the problem, not just the climate change-wise. We may have we may find solutions to the climate change technologically, but the other uh, interventions of the human, we may not be able to. Some people, some economists, are trying to convince the real investors, the capitalists, that the climate, co uh, climate change is going to be very, very costly. And there may be opportunities to make money as well. So that route may be useful, maybe not, but we know that Probably there is something wrong in this picture here. These countries should not go there. We have to find efficient ways to bring down below these green line so that everybody uh, can live harmoniously with nature. We shouldn't keep fighting against it. Maybe we should lose that war, let the nature win, and find other ways to survive on this planet. Thank you very much.